you know we're still talking about kids and family and uh Job 36. There's a guy named E.M. Bounds. His name is Edward McKendry Bounds, but, but he's known as E.M. E.M. Bounds. And he wrote a series of books on uh, prayer. And um, that's what he's really famous for. Those books are amazing. Uh, if you can get them, uh, do not, you know, be careful when you order books, the, these older books, because so many people, what they've done, they've done the same thing to them that they've done to the Bible. Some guy gets them and he edits them and he changes the, uh, you know, the original writers things. And, and some of those alterations that they make are pretty drastic. I got a hold of uh, an old, I've got several of these old writers in my library and I got a hold of one of the newer ones um, a, a new edition. And I wanted to see how much they altered the original author. All of these authors, by the way, it, it's not like they're talking in ancient old English that you can't read. It's not like that. They speak the same English you and I speak. And uh, boy, I got a hold of one and I compared the author's original writing with the 20th century editor who thought he was going to help all us poor dumb folks out. And I'm telling you what, he butchered the old guy's writing. There were big sections missing there. He had changed the, the drift of some of the statements. So I want to encourage you. Uh, you know, I mention authors, I mention books, uh, make sure you're not getting one of these ones that has been updated. Make sure you're getting the complete and unabridged version of whichever book that it is. Ian e. Bounds was famous for those books on prayer, but he, he wrote another book that's lesser known. And the name of that book is called Satan, His Personality, Power, and Overthrow. Just a little tiny book. And it's not a spooky book. You know, he doesn't go into satanic rituals and all that. He just takes a look at the devil purely from a Bible standpoint, and it's a, a you know maybe a hundred pages, and the book is amazing. He has a couple chapters in the book called "Exposed Areas," meaning for the believer there are places that people, without thinking, expose themselves. I mean, they make themselves a target. They they literally unknowingly open a door to the devil's working. And uh, I want to give you a few of those tonight is that in light of the family. You know, every Christian home, and there again, some of you, uh, you're going to have Christian homes down the road, God willing, it should the Lord tarry. And um, I want to give you a few simple things that many Christians, good Christians, without thinking, they swing the door wide open to problems. And I want to give you a few of those tonight if we can get through them. All right. So um, um, I want you to look at Job 36, verse 20. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. The Lord has a lot to say about the night. So keep that place marked and uh, go to John chapter nine, because we're going to be we're going to be back in Job in a few minutes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter nine. John chapter nine. Verse four, the Lord Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Look at first Thessalonians five. 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then you'll hit 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians five, verse four. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Verse seven. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Look at Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs 7. Verse six, for at the window of my house, I looked through my casement and I beheld among the simple ones. And he's talking about someone that's very naive, very inexperienced among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. When did it happen? Verse nine, in the black and dark night. Look at Job chapter 24, Job chapter. So back in Job again, this is Job 24. Job 24, verse 13. Job 24, 13. They are of those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the paths thereof. The murderer rising with the light killeth the poor and the needy, and in the night is as a thief. The eye also of the adulterer waiteth for the twilight, saying, No, I shall see me, and disguiseth his face. In the dark they dig through houses, which they had marked for themselves in the daytime. They know not the light, for the morning is to them even as the shadow of death. If one know them, they are in the, the, the terrors of the shadow of death. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us, Lord, that you would really let tonight accomplish thy will, Lord. And, and that, Lord, generations in this room will be protected in the days to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the first um, exposed areas where a lot of good Christians, they, uh, they, they don't think of this as a big deal. And that is sleepovers. You know, in the Bible, the nighttime, you can see from the verses what the Lord has to say about that. And God holds you and I responsible. He gave those children to us. He gave the children we have to us so that we would supervise them. And often Christian parents are so naive. They are just way too trusting. Oh, but Johnny's a good boy. He's from church. He goes on visitation. He passes out tracks. He sings in the choir. Oh, oh, it'll be okay to let them sleep there. Oh, Susie. Oh, she helps with the nursing home and the church dinners. She helps teach a Sunday school class. She helps out at church camp. Oh, surely it would be fine for them to spend the night there. A few years ago, I heard a, a, a pastor, uh, pastor was a pastor at a large church, and he was talking about a young man that came to his office one day, 
And the young man uh, was thought to be an outstanding youth there in the church. And as he sat in the office that day, he told about how he had been asked to babysit another younger girl in the church, which let me just sidetrack for a minute. Why a teenage young boy would be babysitting a younger girl. That is just bizarre and it should never be. But there he was. And this wonderful young Christian young man had raped her repeatedly over a prolonged period of time. And of course, she was too afraid to say anything. Oh, but pastor, it'll be okay. They're a good young man. You sure about that? At one of the major Bible colleges, uh, there was a guy, he was one of the star trumpeters and uh, on the platform, you know, and a key musician. And um, they, they finally caught him. This one guy, one guy in the church, an, an, an older man and his wife, middle-aged, uh, he worked shift work for a big auto industry. And so, you know, you know, time came for his shift and he would head off to work and, and the young man would wait. And he would watch as he drove to work and then his wife would welcome him in and, and um, adultery had been going on for some time. Oh, but preacher, he's one of the star trumpeters. A family that we know that travels and sings or, or did when their kids were a little younger, they traveled all over the place and um, in churches everywhere. And one evening they were at a, certain, and at a certain church and they made it their family's policy. They had 10 kids. They made it their family's policy that they never let their, their daughters uh, or their young boys for that matter, but their daughters, they never let them sleep anywhere but in their travel vehicles. But on this one particular night, you know, they thought, oh, what's the harm? It's a good guy, good preacher, good family. And during that night, the preacher's daughter propositioned the other girl. Now, you know, we're not saying that that will always happen. That's not what we're saying. But can you see? Why that could be such a dangerous thing? We are not saying that you can never let your kids sleep somewhere else, but it sure is an area of great potential danger. You know, you've got uh, hours of talking and hours of talking late into the night and everybody else is sleeping and, and a little voice from the underworld says, no one will ever know hours of idle talking and in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin the defenses are down tiredness mars judgment and the devil is just watching you do understand that do you not he's just watching and waiting for his opportunity when they're out of your supervision he's waiting You say, well, do you know how many times it takes? Do you know how many times it takes? It only takes once. It only takes once. Got a friend of mine. Good guy. Good church. You know, it's one of those marriages that was sort of half semi-arranged in the church. Both of these kids have grown up. Um in that church. And, and honestly, I, I, I knew them both and I knew the young man and I, I looked at that young man and I thought from a farm, from a farmer's home, um, just, just great people. And I thought this guy had said he was called to preach. I thought, man, there's just potential off the chart here. And he gets married and man, they're not married long and problems, problems. And I'm not just talking about normal marital adjustments. I'm talking about Finally, they catch him, and um, and he was viewing child porn on a computer regularly. And think, where did it come from? You know where it came from? He was with his dad when he was a little boy, and they went to the landfill together. 
And he got wandering around the landfill because daddy was, you know, daddy was rooting through the stuff, you know. And he came across some hardcore, terrible pornography as an eight or nine year old boy. See, back in those days, it wasn't on the computer, but he came across a magazine. And what the devil sowed in his head that day, he never got free of. It only takes once. Let me give you some suggestions. You say, Pastor, did you ever have people over at your house? Yeah, we, we did. And we would we would have, uh, you know, there'd be the odd young person we'd, you know, have over at our house and seldom, almost never. We we, we did. I mean, we, we, I could probably count on one hand the times that one of our girls slept somewhere else uh, or one of our boys slept somewhere else. But we, we would allow people to come. Um, so I want to suggest, uh, give them a reasonable lights out time. And when you say lights out, that means lights out. Do you, do you, do you understand? That means lights out, like no talking, we're done. I used to do this with my kids. I would, uh, we, we did this all the time. Remember we talked about training and we're, we're going to, we will be revisiting this a little bit along the way. And we would give the kids a bedtime at night, and um, and I, sometimes we'd let them we'd let them talk for an hour, whatever you know. And then we would say, okay, guys, you know, at at as they got a little older, it might be ten thirty, might be eleven o'clock. We'd say, okay, guys, uh, no uh, no talking, eyes closed, and um, their bedrooms are in the basement. Um, you know, they they need to understand that you mean what you say. And, and again, they need to learn that when they're this high. See, a whole lot of this is cured when they're this high. If, if, you're, if you're serious about this. But I would, uh, I would sneak down the stairway and I would hide and I would wait. And uh, sure enough, you know, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. So it took it took several shock treatments and we 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 got past all that. But you know what they learned? They learned that lights out was lights out. There was no give on that one. You know, we'd have kids over and uh and we we'd have uh um lights out. And here's where you parents really need to listen. You need to stay up doing something until their lights out. The presence of a responsible adult nearby is a real deterrent to evil. We we never said, okay, you guys, you got to go to sleep at 11 o'clock now. You know, it's 8.30 and I'm tired and I'm going to go to bed. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, uh, if, 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 if you're going to have people in your house and you're going to have young people and they're going to be, okay, um, just stay up as long as they stay up. You say, why? Well, you're present. You're there. You're hearing what's going on. And um, um, the Bible says, make not provision for the flesh. And let me give you another suggestion. Absolutely no bedroom doors closed. Absolutely no bedroom. And that's in that's during the daytime or any other time. We'd have visitors over. We'd have company over. And, um, you know, you get all these kids and they're playing in your house, you know, and every. And uh, but but our kids understood it was one of the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Um, you know, you get you get two or three little kids together and somebody wants to shut a bedroom door. It's like, uh, how come? Why do we need to shut the door? Uh, you get you get some little kid and they want that door shut to keep the adults out. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we will keep all the doors wide open at all times. Um, you will detour. um you'll detour a lot, uh, deter a lot of trouble that way. And of course it is given that this is a sleepover is, is in reference only to friends of the same gender. It would be unthinkable for a young man and a young woman to be having a sleepover of any age. Um, often we're talking about sleepovers, often the beginning of serious decline in some young person's life can be traced back 
to some stay prolonged hours in a private place at some friend or relatives with some friend or relative in their own house. The first pornographic picture, the first discussion of taboo things, the first enticement, the first time someone painted scenes of how fun sin could be. You know what happened? All it was a sleepover. And the parents had checked out. My wife and I, when we were in um, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, one night after church, we were at a gas station. And there was a lady, two or three pumps over, and I gave her a track that night. And, uh, man, she really received the track well. I was really surprised. And um, turns out she was from the, the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what I mean. I'm just being careful for the camera's sake. And uh, even as I gave her the track, I thought so. She had all the marks. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they have a certain haircut. They have a certain way to handle themselves. And um, and I went over to her and I gave her this track. And she said, oh, cool. She said, I don't know. I ever got one of these before. I said, okay, great. You know, well, you know what was amazing about that little track was a week or two went by and she called me. And I know what you're thinking, but it wasn't that way. It was a nice phone call. And she was curious about salvation. She called me a couple times. She was one of those people from that land of Sodom and Gomorrah that had never heard the gospel. You can't, you can't forget that not all of them are in the reprobate category. Many of them have been proselyted or whatever, and they never once heard the gospel in their life. And she was one of those. And uh, she said uh, things like... Um, is it really true that the way we live is wrong? And it was a sincere question. Man, we, we had a great conversation over the phone. I told her, I said, hey, I, I answered her questions very politely, very kindly. I mean, I could tell I had a sincere person on the other line. And I said, look, I said, my wife and I will be glad to come and sit down with you. And she said, well, I'm, I'm not ready for that. And I said, okay, good enough. I said, when you are, let me know. Well, she called back. And she invited my wife and, over, and I over to her house. We went in. It was a nice house. Uh, we had a good visit with her. And uh, we gave her the gospel very clearly. And she did not at that time get saved and this particular visit was the last contact we had with her. But during that visit, she told us how her lifestyle had come about. That area where I pastored was Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and it's a city of about 40,000 people. And it's bordered on the east and the west and the south by farmland. I mean, you got you got that little tiny place, but all around it, just farmland in every direction. She said it was in the barn of a friend that her first encounter took place. It was a friend in a private place, lots of time, nobody else around. That's an exposed area. Christian, you know, uh, you love your kids and you want your kids to do right. You, you're, you're praying for them, no doubt. Um, uh, it is a very, and there could be some of you in this room tonight. Uh, I could have you, you know, if you could do it without embarrassing yourself or incriminating somebody else. I'm sure we've got young people in this room right now that could give testimony to some things that happened when they were staying with somebody. And you know what the parents thought? The parents thought, oh, this will be fine. But it wasn't fine. So the first area of danger is um, sleepovers. This one walks hand in hand with it, and it is their companions. It's their friends, the people that they associate with. So you've got sleepovers and you've got companions, okay? It has been said that the first 10 chapters of Proverbs seem especially aimed at young men and women. Look at Proverbs 1 for just a moment.
Proverbs 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. And so that's where the book of Proverbs opens up. Look at verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with him. Look at verse 14. Cast in thy lot among us. I look at Proverbs 13 for just a moment. Proverbs 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I want you to look at one more. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. That's interesting how it opens up. He says, don't, 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 don't be blindsided. <laughs> Evil communications corrupt good manners. Seems like a strange wording at first. But uh, the word communication just means, I'm going to give you what it means. It means hanging out together. Okay. But I get that from the old dictionary. The word communication, in, and it cites that verse in the definition. It says customary association or familiarity. In other words, somebody that you hang out with. Okay. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Uh, the word manners, again, the old dictionary, it cites the same verse. It means behavior, conduct. So, you know, hanging out with the wrong people corrupts good behavior. Um, you heard it said, but 30 years from now, you'll be the same person that you are today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Another old saying, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. Look at 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 13. Now, we're probably going to elaborate on this. Uh, it won't be tonight. Um, but parents, it's just like the whole sleepover thing. Um, if you're going to have somebody over at your house and it's somebody you trust, and can I say, boy, that there needs to be some real thought put into that. Somebody you trust and you, you think it's, it's, it's okay. This is not an edgy thing for, for Johnny to have Billy over. You think, okay, I think I'm okay with this. I, I, know, I know Billy's parents. I know a little bit about Billy's character. I've watched him. You know, I think this is going to be okay. Um, again, that whole thing of, okay, we're going to give him a lights out. And but we'll be reasonable. You know, we won't make him go to bed at 8 o'clock. We'll, we'll make it reasonable. But I'm going to stay up. I'm going to be nearby. You know, there's not going to be any bedroom doors closed. You see, once again, that the parent must be involved. You know, this, this whole thing of, man, the devil has a hard time when there's a parent nearby, involved, praying, caring, and having their kids, this thing is a priority. In other words, the radar's on. Man, you know what? Uh, that's the, mo the, the, the miracle of modern day warfare is, man, they, you know, you get, you get some country, you get some fighter aircraft with the latest technology, man, they can spot something coming in from way far away. And that's the blessing of radar. 
You know what? We need, uh, you're, you're going you're gonna to do your best to keep the devil out of your home. You're going to have to turn on your radar. And, uh, and that, that, you know, you don't all of a sudden do that. Well, Johnny's 15 now, I guess I need to be careful. No, 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 no. Um, don't, don't forget, don't forget more so than ever. You got seven and eight year olds. They know how to run these things. They know how to bypass safeguards. They know how to go places that their adult parents have no way and they can cover their tracks and they can clear the memory. I tell you what, if, if I'm going to have a reputation, you know, I think a lot of parents, they're, they're too worried about, they're too worried about, they, they want to be the cool mom. They want to be the cool dad. It's like, you know, uh, you know, I, I I would rather be known as the um, as the extremist. I, I I'll wear the badge proudly. Thank you. If I can keep the devil out of my house, I'll wear the badge. A lot of people they're they're afraid, but sometimes it's just they're they're they just got too many irons in the fire. They got too much going on. A wise man of not too many years ago said, an author that wrote on this subject, he said, if you're going to do your job as a parent, you're going to have to resign from some of life's callings and put this high on your focus. Second Samuel 13. Second Samuel 13, verse 1. 2 Samuel 13, verse 1, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister. That means she was good looking. Whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Now you got to remember, these kings had multiple wives. And so, you know, this was uh, one of those stepsister things. Verse 2, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. Now watch, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And as you read the rest of the story, he coached Amnon on how to lure that girl in and rape her. Who did it? A friend friend a change in attitude for the worst have you ever watched it's a teenager have you ever watched and uh you know they're they're decent they're decent they're decent they're decent and man uh you know all of a sudden one day you see them a little while later you can see it on their countenance something's not the same and then you watch their body language all of a sudden you see who they're hanging out and you're going whoa something, something's not good here a change in attitude for the worst is often connected with who they have been allowed to spend time with. And I want to say this, and we're going to real quick jump to the last one. Um, I, um, I watched some friends of mine many years ago, I, a family that my wife and I were very, very close to, a good Christian family, a good Christian family. And um, they... Um, they had several daughters that were the same same age as my daughters, and uh, we we hung out together. We did homeschooling things together. Uh, we we really had quite a close connection. We attended the same church, and um, one summer, they let their three or four teenage kids go spend several weeks with their cousins. And when they came back, they were not the same. They were never the same after that. Which leads us to the next thought. You know, another exposed area of great danger, of absolute blindness for a lot of Christians is how they view their relatives. I want you to consider this last thought with me.
Look with me at Matthew 10. We've talked about sleepovers, companions, and I'll talk to you about the relatives. You know, um, some some Christian families, um, they have enough sense that if there was some kid in the church that had a, a bad reputation, they wouldn't let him spend time with it. But they feel obligated if it's one of their relatives. I'm just here to tell you, you don't have to do that. You just have to determine who you're going to please, whether it's God or your relatives. And you have to determine if it's worth sacrificing your children because you don't have enough courage to say no to your relatives. You're going to have to make a decision. Because it, oh, your relatives, they just have a wicked way of forcing themselves on you. Matthew 10, verse 35. It's going to take some courage, brethren. Matthew 10, verse 35. For I am come to set a man, Jesus said, at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You know, um, look with me at Luke 14. Luke 14. Luke 14, verse 26. Luke 14, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, what, what does he mean there when he says hate? You know, because we're supposed to honor our father and mother. What does he mean by hate? Um, the, the key to that is found in one of the first places the word hate appears. It says, um, Jacob loved Rachel. It says when 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 Leah saw that Rachel was loved and she was hated. Does, did that mean he just couldn't stand Leah? No, that's not what that meant. But it meant was that Rachel was definitely preferred. Uh, Rachel was the one that he loved the most. Um, and so what it means is this thought that when it comes to following the Lord or indulging your family, You've got to make a decision. And the Lord, the Lord says, if you're going to have to love him to such a great degree that they're going to think that you don't love them. Uh, it's not a matter of showing them disrespect. It's a matter of when push comes to shove and who comes first. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, he said, your family's going to misunderstand. He said, it's just the way it's going to be. There will be fierce opposition. They will work against you. They will see any convictions you have as extreme and where it crosses them, they will take it personally. Uh, I knew a couple from uh, Manitoba and um, they, uh, we got to be acquainted with them and um, she got her kids taken away from her over disciplining her kids. And, and, and you know who was instrumental in getting her kids taken away from her for her kids were taken away for months. And, you know, she wasn't abusing them. It wasn't anything like that. But you know who called social services? Her sister. Oh, your relatives, they're just wonderful people, are they? I hope they are. But they're sure not worth sacrificing your kids for. Would you look at Psalm 69 for a moment? I'm telling you, you can teach your kids all the right stuff and you can have them in church and all that stuff. But if you're not careful about their sleepovers, if you're not careful about their friends, yes, 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 you've got to interfere. You've got to be the hard nose. If you don't do that, and if you are too afraid to say no to your relatives, 
you might as well just, just go ahead, go home tonight and kiss your kids and say, I love you and kiss them goodbye. Because when they turn 17, 18, 19, they're going to go a direction that's going to be horrible. And you're going to go, what did I do? Well, here's what you did. The devil walked right in your door through sleepovers, through their companions, and through the relatives. Look at Psalm 69, verse 8. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, now watch, and an alien unto who? My mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Probably the worst opposition that Mitzi and I ever faced came from Christian family. And they weren't, uh, they weren't Mormons or JWs, by the way. Your connection to your blood kin, how strong is it? For some people, it dominates them. It dominates their every decision. It determines how they discipline their kids and where they live. And, and it interferes with their marriage. And every once in a while, you'll see it. You'll see it even with people that say they're called to the mission field and and then um, their their parents interfere and, you know, they're afraid they won't get to see the grandkids and all that stuff. They will destroy your relationship with your husband or your wife. This will destroy your joy and your freedom. It is a misplaced loyalty. Our first, our first loyalty must be to God. That's who our first loyalty must be to. So I want to close that tonight. I, I do want to say this. I do want to say this on the same thought. Unless, you're, unless your family members are just 100% think just like you, which is probably not likely for most of you. You know who's going to work against you? A lot of times it'll be, it'll be, it'll be somebody in your family. Uh, they're going to interfere with the discipline. They're going to, they're going to not like what you, you know. You're going to say, you know, mom, I really don't want my kids to do that, and they're going to ignore you, and they're going to, and then that just keeps on coming, keeps on coming. Um, I remember at one point my my mother looked at me, my 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 real mother. I didn't grow up with her, but we got to visit her once in a while, and. Um, and I had the kids and she said, uh, she always called me Joey. She said, Joey, is it okay if I put on such and such a video? And I was familiar with what it was. And uh, and I looked at her and I said, oh, I, you, know, you, you know, you do try to be nice. And I said, mother, I said, I really don't feel comfortable with that. And I said, uh, you know, there's a few reasons why, but I just, I just don't want to do that. And... Um, you know, it, it didn't go over, it didn't go over real well. But you're going to have to have some courage. Sometimes there'll be, I, you know, I, I don't know what it is with with people. Sometimes uh, I, I don't know that it's age. I think sometimes sometimes people get softer as they get older, and they forget what's needed in children. Or sometimes it's because. They didn't discipline their own children. They were loose with their own children. And so they don't understand uh, anybody trying to toe the line. But in a friend's church of mine, not long ago, they had an older couple that came and, and um, seemed like a sweet old couple. And I met them. And um, uh, last time I was there, they weren't there. And I said, where's so-and-so? And they said, oh. They said, you know, they were a sweet old couple, and and the old lady in, of, of the couple, she she sort of was trying to be grandma to everybody. But here's what she would do. The parents would say, um, you know, you know, I, she would say, Can I give him some candy? And 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 she and and the parent would say, No, I, I don't want Johnny to have candy. And she'd wait till the parents weren't looking and she'd give the kid candy anyway. Um, the parents would go to correct their kids and right in front of the parents, she'd say, oh, your mom, dad, they're just a little too hard. Just ignore them. 
That's what your relatives are going to do probably and probably much worse. You say, what do you do? Do I not go see my relatives? No. Sure, go see him. Make sure you're there. You may have to keep the visit short and sweet. Go. Go visit. Be sweet. Be kind. But don't you turn your back on them with your kids. The devil is waiting. So three areas. I want you to remember them. Sleepovers, your friends, and your relatives. You're fighting to keep out danger, and you're doing a good job. But in your, in your innocence, you'll think, oh, this is no problem. I can trust these people. And that will be where Satan will find his hole in the wall. And you need to remember that. All right, let's pray. Lord, these are simple things. I pray that you take them. I pray that you would impress them. Lord, we, I pray, Lord, that the young people here would not forget these things. Lord, they are so true. It's unbelievable how these things play out. Lord, help them to realize there are very few exceptions to these things. And the exception only proves the rule. God, help them. Help all of us, Lord. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I don't know. Maybe there's something there. Maybe it's even unrelated to the message, but something God spoke to you about. So take a minute and talk to the Lord. Lord, bless your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.